Welcome to the CEC Report. It's the 7th of December. I'm Robert Barwick, and joining me today is former ANZ Director John Dalson. Welcome, John. Thank you. In this week's CEC Report, this is an interview with John, which is a follow-up on the previous interview that I did with him in response to questions that viewers raised about the subjects that John was talking about in that last interview. Um, before we begin, though, let me just uh, mention a few developments from this week in terms of our campaign to break up the bank. So, um, on Monday, John, this was a significant breakthrough, Alan Kohler, who's probably Australia's foremost financial commentator, um, he wrote a column in The Australian rec giving recognition to the fact that when he looked at the Royal Commission website at the public submissions, he said a random sample of everyone I clicked on was without exception calling for the banks to be broken up and naming Glass-Steagall. Now, that is a reflection of our work. We, when, when, the, when the commissioner asked for, for submissions on the question of structural separation, as he said, is, um, is structural change in the industry necessary was the last question in his interim report. We put out the call and you made those submissions and Kohler noticed that. And then Kohler said that, quote, an Australian version of Glass-Steagall would make it uniform, that is, make separation uniform. And what he meant by that is some banks are divesting, some are not, right? So he said it would make it uniform and would make sure they didn't slide back into their bad old one-stop shop ways in future. So very important um, endorsement. Today, another development. UBS analyst Jonathan Mott. Now, UB, Jonathan Mott's division of UBS um, specialised in analysing the um, housing industry. And he's, he's the person who first blew the whistle on what they call liar loans, 500 billion of the mortgages out there being liar loans. His division is predicting that Commissioner Hain, from his royal, in his final report, will recommend the separation of banking and wealth activities. Quote, we believe a mandated structural separation of banking and wealth management operations appears more likely following the final round of hearings at the Royal Commission. And that's in the Australian, that's what Jonathan Mott said in the Australian today. So that's a prediction, doesn't mean it's necessarily going to happen, but it just shows you a lot of people thinking in that direction, right? And that's, of course, one of the things we'll be talking about today. And I just want to add this final thing, it's not before time. Digital finance analytics Martin North, who um, John also appeared on his show recently, he, he put up a post this week reporting that the consensus view is now is that property prices will fall at least 20% in Sydney and Melbourne. That's become the consensus forecast. And he was making the point that that means a lot of people are already underwater in terms of negative equity. So there's a serious consequences there. Um, uh, the Australian branch of the Denmark bank, Saxo Bank, though, came out and forecast a 50% drop. Now these are, these are worrying signs for the economy, for the housing market, and for the banks themselves. This, is, this has been our argument all along. However, in contrast to that, instead of, instead of announcing that we should take steps to reform the banks and, and fix them so they don't get into this, these kind of bad practices again, the Reserve Bank's Guy de Bell yesterday came out and announced that the, the RBA was prepared to lower rates further and even resort to quantitative easing, monetary, money printing, in order to stimulate the banks. So don't make them change, we'll just keep propping them up with those measures. And that's, that's been the story since the global financial crisis globally, right? It would be a disaster if we allowed that to happen instead of actually force the banks to reform. So that's just to set, that helps set the scene for the discussion um, uh, I'm about to have with John. And because John as a, as, now I, I just wanna make this point about you, John. You, you haven't been an ANZ director for 14 years, is that right? That's right, yes. So therefore, let's make it clear, we can't hold you accountable <laughs> for the state of the current banking system, and you don't claim to have special knowledge of inside the banks at the moment no, at I all. Do not, no, I do not. Right? And it's because it's been so long that you're actually prepared to speak out. That's so there right. is no conflict of interest But this there. is the first time I have been prepared to talk. That's right. Um, because I think you, you've got to leave a long period before you retire from a company before you, you should talk, and I think that 14 to 15 years is fair enough. Uh, I agree, and I think ironically though, it gives you the perspective of, a, as, I, as I mentioned last time, a, a different generation of banker, mm -hmm. right? Who can look at the same problems and see, you know, this is there's, there's been a general, there's been a ch cultural change here, which is frankly mm -hmm. has been disastrous. So let's start with that. If I could just make this comment, uh, I'm not commenting anything about ANZ. Um, I'm commenting about the sector. Sector, the system. Which is that's a, right. Quite, a, a, quite an important difference. Yep. There's no way am I going to talk about uh, issues I was associated with at ANZ. That would be very unprofessional. 
Exactly. Well, so let's talk about another bank then instead of ANZ, uh, NAB. So the Royal Commission hearings, John, are over. But in the last week, I found it personally shocking. I know you did as well. National Australia Bank Chairman Ken Henry was on the stand. And frankly, I think his performance was, um, it was arrogant, right? It was, it was out of touch. It was a shocker. A lot of people have commented on that, including people that used to put Hen Ken Henry up on a pedestal. But probably this, of all the things he said and did, probably the single most shocking thing he said was, he stated that it would take 10 years to change the bank's culture. So as an experienced former bank yourself, bank director, who's, you know, as a director, all directors are responsible for these matters. What was your response to that statement by Ken Well, um, I couldn't believe it um, because the shareholders are simply not going to accept that. Um, clearly, NAB, like the other banks, needs a lot of change. But suggest it's going to take 10 years is absolute nonsense. And if he feels that he can't lead the bank board to achieve change a lot earlier than that, he really should step aside um, because he's, he's doing the, um, uh, the NAB brand a lot of uh, damage. And it's interesting that some of the other uh, bank uh, CEOs or chairman, I can't remember which, uh, came out to disassociate themselves yeah. with, the, with the idea. And uh, uh, one uh, important issue is that, in effect, um, he's saying that, uh, that, that huge amount of cultural change is needed and, and, um, and he's got to work through all the divisions and all the people to achieve. Well, that's, that's absolutely sheer nonsense. There are ways of achieving change a lot, a lot faster than that. Um, and um, I think his fellow board members should be, should be very concerned. I hope it doesn't reflect the views of the other directors, but I'm sure there's going to be a lot of pressure from analysts on NAB yeah. um, on this very subject, as but, there should be. But isn't he also making eff effectively our case for us that if, okay, if we take him at his word, it's going to take 10 years, that by definition proves that the bank is too complex, well, too I, large and must be broken up. Well, I've had a view even going back in my days, banks are extraordinarily complex institutions uh, and they've become more complex uh, uh, since I retired. Um, and I think that, that one of the problems we've got at the moment is that they're so complex that the boards and the management team can't manage them. Um, and you know what's happened is there's a huge disconnect uh, from the CEO down to the coalface. And what's been extraordinary is that a lot of people in the bank for the first time understood a lot of things that's happening at the coalface. Yeah. Now, they're so complex. They've got so many divisions, so many different activities which are all quite different. So it's extremely hard for the senior management team to stay in contact with the customers and know what's going on. And indeed, stay in contact with their frontline staff who will tell them what's going on. So it, it, his was an admission that, the, uh, that at least for NAB, um, structurally, uh, it will not be able to uh, not be able to cope. Does it also? Uh, you, you, I know you have views on the. Tr one of the things that we talk about, you have you have definite views on the Australian Treasury. In the case of Ken Henry, you've got a an, an, a NAB director and now chairman who came straight out of Treasury, long term Treasury head in Australia, and to me that's also surprising. You know this this relationship between the the banks and Treasury, we call it the revolving door. But when he's, when he's expressing a certain attitude, would you say he's not just expressing an attitude on behalf of the bank, but he is also telling us how, you know, sort of letting, in, letting out a little bit how Treasury views these things well, as well? Well, yes, I think it's, he finds it difficult to associate his role as chairman of NAB and his former role um, at Treasury. And uh, I think this is, this is a very interesting subject because uh, some people uh, on paper look as if they'll make outstanding directors. But with the problem a lot of people, they become what I call occupation bound. In other words, he spent a lot of his life in Treasury uh, and he probably did very well in Treasury and he thinks like a treasurer. Um, and you would, you would argue that he hasn't had enough diversified experience to be chairman of a complex company. And, um, and, and, not, and to be skilled in managed Treasury is only part of the role as chairman of a bank. Um, and I think this applies to a lot of other people who are going on, the, on boards these days. They become occupation bound. They spend so much time as a lawyer or an accountant or, or whatever. And, and when they go on boards, they can't break out of their, uh, of their life training and they can't um, look at things uh, more broadly. And they get their own uh, occupation uh, out of balance in their decision making. And I think that's what's happening with uh, Ken, Henry, Ken Henry, I should say. And uh, he's not the only person that that happens with. No, because 
it is very difficult, if you've been in occupation for a long time, it is very difficult to break out of that um, and to uh, be sensitive and to understand other major levers um, in, in running a business. I mean, you might read about it, but to, um, but to, to understand those levers and not get your own lever out of perspective um, is it, quite difficult. And I remember on one board I was on where a very senior Treasury official was on the board and uh, all he could talk about was interest rates. Now he's dead, so I can feel I can say it. Now this particular company was so successful, it wouldn't matter if you lifted interest rates by 2% or dropped it by 2%. It was so successful, interest rate didn't matter. But we had to listen to his lecture on the current state of interest rates. And when you started to talk about the real issues facing the company, he got bored. Mm. Well, that's Please no, don't try and guess that's, that's, what that company is. <laughs> okay. That's an interesting insight. Let's take a quick break and continue this afterwards. Welcome back to the CEC Report, where I'm talking with former ANZ Bank Director John Dalson. So, John, like the CEC, you support the concept of the Glass-Steagall separation of banks between commercial divisions uh, with, with deposits and the other types of divisions, investment banking, etc. But from your, in your own words, why do you think it's important, that well, concept? Well, uh, I, I come at this from a, a, a different point of view. Uh, I believe that banking is so complex, uh, I don't believe that the current boards and managements are adequately coping with it, as has been proven yep. at the Commission. And I think the structure of banking uh, needs to be simplified. Um, and it's interesting how well Macquarie Bank are doing, because Macquarie Bank, uh, who I think will finish up as big as one of the trading banks, is in reality a very simple, has a very simple structure and a very simple line of business. And if you listen to the CEO of, of Macquarie Bank, he understands everything that's going on in that bank. He understands what's happening at the coalface. He understands all the deals. Now, he may be a remarkable uh, CEO and he may be, may, may be an exception, but if you compare him with the CEO of a trading bank, they are far, far further removed from the reality of what's, it's what, what's happening in the marketplace and what their frontline staff are telling them. So my, my view is that the banks should be broken up to make them easier to manage. Now, it just so happens um, that the uh, Glass-Steagall Act uh, is one way of doing it. Um, and I think there are sound uh, principles that, that, uh, that reinforce that. The, uh, it's interesting that you make the point about complexity as your, as your motivating factor. As we've just been discussing, in the terms of reference for this Royal Commission, there is nothing in there about structure. The, the Commissioner Hayne was not given any scope to look at the structure of banks. However, he, in his interim report, he repeatedly questions structure for the same reason you said, it's a question of complexity. Yeah. Right? And he says, is the issue here, these, these institutions are too complex and therefore have to be, um, does, does there have to be structural change? Also, I have to, I'd, I'd like to comment that um, you talk about the banks are too complex to be managed. Dr. Wilson Sy, who's from the regulator, APRA, makes the same argument about regulation. That because the banks are too complex, the, regu the, the regulatory structure is too complex. That's right. And it must also be simplified. That's right. And he's, that's why he supports class That's right. I, I think it's inevitable that the banks will be broken up because if you start looking at it from the perspective of regulation, there is so much regulation on a bank. I, I don't understand how the modern bank copes with it. And one consequence of breaking them up is that the regulation becomes more specialised and the regulators can be more effective. But look, there's one big elephant in the room that everyone uh, is not talking about. The fact is that our four main trading banks represent 80% uh, of, uh, of bank assets. There's a, an oligopoly and yeah. as a result of regulation, there's an incredible sameness about the banks and you could change the label of one bank for another and people wouldn't, wouldn't uh, know the difference. And the consequence of an oligopoly is that there is a lack of uh, competition. Now, there are cartel provisions in the competition law, but they're exceedingly difficult to, to apply. So we've got a, we've got a, a structure that is over-concentrated, um, which is another reason why they should be broken up, apart from the, 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 the ability to manage them. I think it's extraordinary that the directors of these banks had no knowledge of all the problems that were happening at the coalface. And it's extraordinary the millions of dollars 
they've spent in legal fees um, understanding what's going on. Now, I don't believe that would have applied at Macquarie Bank. I think Macquarie Bank would have known exactly what's going on. So the fact that the, the boards and the, and the leadership teams were so remote from what's happening at the coalface is another uh, aspect uh, of uh, complexity and the need for them to broken up, making them easier to manage. Um, just for the, uh, forgive me, just for the sake of the, the viewers not being confused, um, the CEC often makes an issue out of Macquarie Bank in terms of what it does business in, but you're not commenting on that. You're commenting on the fact that whatever it's doing for its business, the, the management is, is knows what it's doing. Yes, that's like, right. Yeah. They're I'm not making any, any yeah, comment about yeah, yeah. the business that Macquarie's in because I do have uh, some question marks about it. What I'm, all I'm commenting yeah. about Macquarie it's, it's simple got a much and he knows what he's doing. Yep. Uh, and the board, uh, the subcommittees, and the CEO, uh, right on top of that company. Yep. That's one of the reasons why it's so successful. They know what's going on in that bank. So, just so you've commented, you've, you've commented on some of this, but I, I just want to, your, your quick thoughts again. Um, there's three areas that you that in, in our discussions that you keep talking about: complexity, oligopoly competition. Yeah. These things really weren't able to be part of the Royal Commission discussion, but you think they are the key issues. Well, I, I think a lot of the problems can be, be solved um, by, uh, by structural change and by, getting more by simplification and getting more competition in because uh, they become easy to manage uh, and uh, easy to regulate and easier to focus on customers. I mean, if you look at the Macquarie model again, uh, they would have an intense uh, understanding of their customers because of the structure that they've got um, and our banks I can't keep I can't under I can't uh, overestimate th their complexity I mean I uh, I had terrible trouble uh, coping because the banks got so many disparate activities they're so complex yeah there's so much technology about and that's been compounded since I've gone I don't know how a bank director at the moment could cope and I've got to say, with some of the criticisms that are made with some of the directions, what they're doing or not doing, um, I've got a certain amount of sympathy because I think you'd almost need to be a full-time director to be on top of everything you're required to be on top of, whether it be, uh, whether it be regulation, whether it be uh, customer issues, uh, uh, whatever. So what do you think about, I would argue, what do you think about it though, that if you had a Glass-Steagall system, a structure, you could have a lot of smaller commercial banks, not these big four behemoths, a lot of smaller ones that are far more flexible for their customers' needs, but still have um, stability in the system where you know, you're not going to be worried about banks falling over all the time. Well, I, th I think you'd get, you'd get more stability um, because the separating of retail banking from commercial banking and, of course, wealth management and insurance, which should be, should be separate anyway, yep, yep. Um, of itself brings more players into the market and it enables uh, greater specialisation um, and it also deals with this uh, dreadful issue of the um, of derivatives and the government, uh, the government guarantee of deposits. I don't think the government guarantee of deposits should be available for general banking. I think that's absolutely wrong because I think that bank guarantee should only be available in the retail bank where they're serving retail retail yep. customers like residential mortgages, etc. Yeah. Where and, and where the ordinary man in the street can put their money on deposit and have it guaranteed by the banks. But the notion of and, and with limited uh, limited derivatives, only derivatives that match your bank your bank uh, liability and your assets. And then all these other things where there's a different profile of risk, um, including the risk inherent in in, in uh, derivatives, are in the commercial bank. And you could have a different deposit profile. Uh, you may have a higher mix of wholesale funds. Um, you will, your, your staff will be quite different. Um, as I said, different risk profile. Um, and you can, you can get, in each case, you can get much closer to your customers because that's what's fundamentally wrong at the moment. They're too distant from their customers. They don't understand what their customers are, what is occurring to them. All right, John, let's take another quick break and we'll finish this after the break. Welcome back to the CEC Report, where I'm having a discussion with former ANZ Director John Darlson. So finally, John, in the time we've got left, this just uh, some of the other comments that people made after your last interview, 
that struck them was your perspective as a, as a different generation of banker. And they've asked how branches used to function once upon a time, much in a sense more autonomously. The branch manager had more authority more over, more power over, uh, over who got loans, etc. cetera. Um, was that a better system? Uh, for the times, it was a better system. Um, and there were a lot of very good characteristics about that because not only would a bank manager tell you when to lend, but more importantly, he would tell you when not to lend. Right. Um, and what this meant is that the upper echelons of the bank had a much closer understanding of what's happening at the customer level. Now, what's happened since then is with technology, uh, bank products have changed quite dramatically. And the touch points, the customer touch points in a modern bank product was, is far less. So you can't, quite, you can't go back to the old fashioned model but what you've got to do now, with the limited number of touch points you have with the customer in today's, you've got to maximise that. And the banks aren't doing it. And there are ways of staying in contact with the customer. I'm not talking about uh, surveys and this sort of stuff. And, 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 and I'm talking about uh, ways and means by which, even though the t products are delivered um, with technology, you can still understand the expectations and what it is the customers want. The other comment that probably relates to this is, is people were struck by your, what you said about the frontline staff of banks and how they've been undervalued and, in a sense, abused with these changes well, over the well, time. Th you that's right. You really see, what's that. happened is uh, the banks in chasing return on equity, there's three levers. There's the borrowing, there's the borrowing limit, and uh, there's the income, and there's the cost. And uh, what the banks have done is that they've driven the performance of staff on the revenue side, on the other side with cost. They've cut the cost of staff uh, and the only third lever being the amount of capital to debt, which is regulated by the, by APRA. So um, there's been a twofold pressure on staff. On the one hand, they're being pushed uh, into achieving more sales, and uh, on, on the other, they're suffering a lot of uh, insecurity. So I'm very sad about the fact that this hasn't been drawn out in the current inquiry, how, how badly the staff of the banks have been treated. I, I, I think it's wrong. Um, and all the bankers I talk to in banks at the moment, they're unbelievably sad and fearful. Um, and there should be more exposure of the pressure that's being put on them. It's wrong. Yeah, the contrast to that is, um, just, just uh, very quickly, in the, so many times it came out of the Royal Commission that the boards approved these bonuses for the top executives, even with massive scandals on the table, right? And they were signing off on these bonuses seemingly without question asked. Did that surprise you? Uh, well, I think it's, uh, I think it's outrageous. Um, and I think that's one thing that's uh, likely to change. The one change that, that, that I want is clawback arrangements. Because with the very senior people like the CEO, um, you, don't, you don't understand the impact of his decisions, sometimes for several years. Yeah, right. And uh, I, I think you should be able to claw back uh, over a much longer period than you, you, you currently have. And the other thing, is that will force the people to think longer term. If you've got short-term bonus system, they'll think short-term. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's human behaviour. So they must be restructured to um, have longer-term uh, longer term consequences. John, don't take this the wrong way, but I think you're an example where an older head can be a new broom. It sweeps through the system. But listen, we've run out of time. Thank you very much for coming and joining us again today. We appreciate this. If anyone has any questions, make comments on YouTube and um, I'll discuss them with John later and we might be able to do this sometime in the new year again. Thanks very much for watching the CEC Report. Tune in next week for more.